the Old Testament promises. And that's just a real easy, simple way to remember and look at it. The New Testament is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament promises that God made to His creation that ended up being a fallen mankind and all of those things. And the promise mainly is that God is sending us a Redeemer. He's sending us a Messiah. Sending us <coughs> someone to deliver and make a way out of the sinfulness that we brought upon ourselves as mankind. This morning's sermon I've titled Away in a Manger. Uh, Sister Kay didn't know that. The people that chose the songs, it just kind of worked out. I mean, when you talk about a Christmas message, you got like six songs to choose from, so the odds are pretty good, right? Uh, but the title of the message is Away in a Manger this morning. 400 years ago, it seems like a long time, doesn't it? You think back, 400 years ago, 1622. Uh, a couple of things that happened in the year 1622. It was in 1622 that they decided that January 1st would be the first day of the calendar year, right? Uh, you know, it had been March 25th before that. I don't know how March 25th could be the first day of anything, but uh, that's what it was. And so in 1622, they determined and decided that January 1st would start the new calendar year, 400 years ago. You may have also heard about the Jamestown Massacre, in which the native Indians slaughtered th almost 350 English settlers uh, outside of Jamestown, Virginia. Well, that happened 400 years ago in 1622. 400 years is a long time. And I bring up those examples and I say that because that's how much time elapsed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, most commentators call it 400 years of silence. There wasn't a word uh, through a prophet. There wasn't a word from the Lord. It was 400 years of silence from heaven. Okay? Um, and so when we start the New Testament, it's been 400 years since God has moved uh, through the prophets or through His Word. Let me give you three very quick points this morning uh, as we jump here into the New Testament. Let me start by saying this. God's promises are rock solid. Amen? God's promises are rock solid. Whenever we left off a couple of weeks ago in the book of Malachi, we read chapter 3 in which God <clears throat> promised through the prophet Malachi that he was sending his messenger. He was sending a messenger to the world. And we know and understand that messenger was John the Baptist. Okay, And, and John the Baptist would announce the arrival of the Messiah. He would let everyone know He's here. He's come. And we'll learn about that here in a few weeks. But, but that was the prophecy. And now 400 years later, it's being written about again. It's being talked about. It's, it's coming uh, to fruition. It starts with John there in, in Luke. And that's what we're going to look at. But it, it, it's this idea of God fulfilling the prophecy that was given through the prophet Malachi, uh, through John the Baptist, whose sole purpose was to announce that the Savior is here. Okay? The Savior is here. I couldn't help but to think about. Uh, so we use we use an app called Life 360. Anybody here ever heard of Life 360? Boy, Life 360 is great because you can literally uh, <coughs> spy on your kids. <laughs> now we have the the premium version, ten or eleven bucks a month, and and we can watch Rylan and Asher wherever they go, whatever they're doing. We can see. I can tell you right where they are. And it's beneficial for us because Ryan goes to school out in Nashville and we keep tabs on him and, and yell at him and those things whenever necessary. And so um, I, I really like it because you can see where they are and when they're coming, when they're going to get here. Like I can see uh, Ryan. I can even see how fat, fast he was going. 81 miles an hour on Friday. <laughs> 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 oh. That must have been when mom was driving. <laughs> but I like Life 360 because when, when Rylan is traveling home from Nashville, I can watch him. And ordinarily he leaves early that morning and I can say, oh man, he left. 
He's on the way. It'll even tell you how long before he gets here, right? And usually that time's a little shorter because my man moves on down the road. Okay? <laughs> that way. And so I become the announcer. I let Adrian and Asher and Harper know. Rod has left Nashville. He'll be here at 7 o'clock. And I, and I announce all along the way and to the point, oh, he's in Muleville. He's in Richlands. He's in Rock Creek. And here he is. And so I become the announcer. And what we see there in the book of, of Malachi is that John the Baptist is promised he's going to be the announcer. And John the Baptist is announcing that Jesus Christ has come. You have to understand what an important message that is. What an important responsibility God has given John to make this announcement. And so that's why when you get into the book of Luke, which we're going to look at today, that's why there's so much emphasis placed on Zacharias and John and, and, and how he came into the world through Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, and all of these uh, different pieces. So, Again, God's promises are rock solid. Let me show you exactly what I mean. Pick it up with me in chapter 4, verse 5 of Malachi first. Again, this is 400 years before Christ. Behold, I will send you who, church? Elijah. Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. I wish you would underline or just remember that promise about Elijah. Okay? Now, flip over to Luke 1. So it's, uh, you got to go through Matthew, uh, a few pages there. Go to, uh, go to Matthew and Mark, a few pages there. Start in Luke 1. If I have to choose a passage to talk about as it relates to Christ, I like Luke 1 and 2. 400 years, the heavens have been silent. Now a word from the Lord, not spoken or written for 400 years. It seems God really meant it when He said one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The people there, and they are waiting. And one day something wonderful happens. Remember that before Jesus died upon the cross, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies every year. And when the priest goes into the Holy of Holies, he was the only one that could go in and he would make atonement for the sins of the people. Really what he was doing was he was making a sacrifice, hoping and praying that God would forgive the sins of the people one more time. And sometimes um, it went well. Sometimes he'd go back there and he'd make atonement for sin and God would accept that sacrifice. They tell me that on the bottom of his cloak, there were bells. This isn't biblical. This is tradition. There were bells, and as the priest entered into the Holy of Holies, the children of Israel stood outside, and they listened for those bells. Because when they heard the bells coming to the, toward them, they know that their sins had been atoned for one more year. They didn't hear the bells, tradition says, that there was a rope tied around his ankles. And if he got back in there, in there into the Holy of Holies and he did something wrong, God would strike him down dead on the spot. Nobody else could go into the Holy of Holies or else they would be stricken down dead. So it made sense to tie a rope to his ankles. And if there, if there was little to no movement for a few minutes, I sort of see some of the guys out there Kind of like fishing, right? You tug on that rope a little bit, and if there's no movement or sound, you drag the dead priest out, you dress up the next in line, you pat him on the backside and say, get in there. I don't know for certain, but I can't imagine that a lot of people signed up to be priests. And so, keep that in mind. The priest enters into the Holy of Holies. He goes there to atone for the sins of man. Basically, he's making this sacrifice and he's asking God for one more year. Please God, one more year without severe judgment. One day, the priest, his name is Zacharias. Again, 400 years of silence. Zacharias puts on all of his uh, priestly attire. There's bells on the bottom of his cloak. Must have been a little nerve-wracking when they tied the rope around his feet. 
But he shuffles in there into the Holy of Holies to offer a sacrifice, but becomes startled because for the first time in his history as a priest, he's not alone. The priest went in alone. He didn't go in with them. You may go to the edge of the Holy of Holies, but you did not go in there. Why? The penalty was death. That was a little bit of the law. They knew what would happen. But on this particular day, Zacharias marches in there to do his priestly duty, and someone's in there with him. You have to understand how unusual and frightening this must have been. You ever walked into a room thinking you were alone and someone is standing there? Imagine going into the Holy of Holies and an angel is standing there. Look at verse 8. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, in other words, he's just doing his priestly duties, his lot fell to burn incense. <laughs> I like the way Luke says it. His lot fell. In other words, okay, man, it's your turn. <laughs> and he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. <clears throat> All the people were out there, outside of the temple. Zacharias marches in to do his priestly duty. Verse 11 says, An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was what? What's some different word? My Bible says trouble. What does yours say? Startled. I think scared to death would have been appropriate right here. Right? He was startled. He was troubled. And it says, and fear fell upon him. I don't know if he froze. I don't know if he hit his knees. It was obvious to him and the angel, he was scared. And I don't blame him a bit. Immediately, the angel says to him in verse 13, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Why? Because Elizabeth had been married. Okay? And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. This is the promise that now God is making through the angel to Zacharias. Please get that mental picture. Right? Because for years and years and years, as a Levitical priest, you have cautiously and carefully gone into the temple, into the Holy of Holies to perform your duties, but on this particular day, this one time, there's an angel, and he comes and he joins you there. Notice what else Gabriel says in verse 15. He says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from the mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay? There it is. 400 years earlier, God said to the prophet Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you, remember I told you to remember, Elijah. I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Remember verse 17? He will go before him in the spirit and power of who? Elijah. Elijah. So 400 years later, God is fulfilling that promise. He's bringing that prophecy to me. God is now ready to fulfill it. And isn't it wonderful that his promise didn't waver? Because sometimes we wait and we wait and we wait on the Lord, don't we? And we wonder if his promises will be fulfilled. We wonder if he's still listening. We wonder what he's up to. His promises didn't waver. It didn't change. It wasn't adjusted. Even though it took him 400 years, he did not forget. That's what I mean when I say his promises are rock solid. 
you can believe in the promises in the Bible. You can believe in what God has promised us. He promised in John 3.16 that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we won't go to hell, but we'll have eternal life. That's a promise. He promised us as in Proverbs 3 that if we will trust in Him with all of our heart and submit to Him, then our paths will be straight. In other words, easier to understand. He promises in Hebrews 13 that He will not leave us and He won't forsake us. He tells us in Isaiah 40 that when we get weary and weak, if we'll hope in Him, He will renew our strength. He tells us in Jeremiah 29 that, that He will help us prosper, that He won't bring harm upon us, that He'll give us a hope and a future. In Philippians, He promises to meet our needs, to give us strength, and on and on the promises go. God's promises are rock solid. He says what He means, and He means what He says. All oh, but the two greatest promises. We think of Romans 6.23 where it says that the wages of sin is death. That's why we all die. The wages of sin is death. That's a promise. But the greater promise is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. He's promised that to us. His promises are rock solid. And so that promise that was made in Malachi is now being fulfilled here 400 years later. But now, God has to get Jesus into the world. He has to get Himself into flesh. Here's how it happened. Number two, God's plan was really specific. God's plan was really, really specific. The people waited that day for their priest, Zacharias, to come out of the temple. They waited and waited and waited. I wonder if they tugged the rope a little and I can sort of see Zacharias he's having a conversation with an angel he's receiving the most important message that we would ever receive that the Messiah is coming that the prophecy that was given and the promise that was made is now being fulfilled and so they waited and they waited and they waited verse 21 says that they marveled that he lingered so long in the temple Maybe it was getting close to lunchtime. I don't know. Maybe it was getting close to supper time. I don't know. They marveled. They were amazed. Of course he lingers. He's receiving the most important message in the history of mankind. But when he come, when he came out, he couldn't talk. Boy, that would have been frustrating. You get this kind of message. You come out of the Holy of Holies. You exit the temple. All of the, the people are there. Right? They're, they're, they're waiting for that word. They're, what happened in there? What took you so long? And he couldn't talk. Couldn't say a word. Why? Because he doubted the promises of God. God shut his mouth. He couldn't say a word until Elizabeth delivers John. I sort of thought about that movie, Doctor Strange 2. If I didn't have kids, I wouldn't have gone to see them. <laughs> but we go to see Doctor Strange 2 and there's one part where Wanda, who's the villain she removes the mouth of Black Bolt and he can no longer talk or say anything am I right Ash? am I close? I got it good he's judging me right now as he <coughs> right. but she removes the mouth and he can no longer speak and, and I sort of thought about Zacharias comes out. He's received this message. The Messiah is coming. The people are waiting. And he's... Mm, mm, mm. They're doing sign language and all these different things. And he can't share the message. Because he doubts God's promise. Now, I also want you to notice just how specific God's plans were for getting His Son here for getting him in flesh. It wasn't willy-nilly. It wasn't half-hearted. It wasn't without detail. God sends his angel to Mary and tells her everything she needs to know. Pick it up in verse 26. Okay? Verse 26. Now in the sixth month, people get confused. This isn't June. This is the sixth month into Elizabeth's pregnancy. She's been pregnant six months. 
We didn't read it, but verse 24 up above says that she hid herself for five months after she conceived. Now Luke is tying it together with Elizabeth's pregnancy with Mary. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. It's the same Gabriel, the same angel, that visited Zacharias in the Holy of Holies six months earlier. And he goes, verse 27, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was what? Like who? Zacharias. <laughs> See the parallel? She was troubled at his saying. Why? Because when we get in the presence of God and his angels, we get troubled. And considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, just like you did the priest, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name, what church? Jesus. Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. How long? forever and of his kingdom there will be no end boy that's worth underlining then Mary said to the angel Mary has some questions about this amen because up above Mary's a virgin she has some concerns okay Mary said to the angel how can this be since I do not know a man and the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, it's her cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Right? We hear... Paul echoed that same sentiment later to the Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who does what? <laughs> Strengthens me. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the man, the maid servant of the Lord. In other words, I am yours, God. I'm yours. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. God's plan was really specific. Angel Gabriel uh, reveals specifically that Mary's going to have a child, even though she's a virgin. Angel tells her that the Holy Spirit is going to place the child in her womb. God even goes so far as to tell her what the child will be named. Jesus, which we know means Savior. Specifically the one who saves His people from their sin. I love, love, love the deliberateness of God here. How specific he's being. There are no questions left to be answered. There's no wondering what he's up to or what he's doing. It is time, 400 years later, it's time for his son to enter the world for the sole purpose of dying for the world. And boy, isn't that something? That Jesus Christ is the only human being in human history who was born solely to die. That God brought him into this world so that his life might be ended for your sin and for mine. That he may die. Number three, I want you to see this. We know that God's plan was really specific. But Jesus' birth was remarkably simple. Jesus' birth was remarkably simple. There's no fanfare. There's no... Uh, big to do, you know, like when the, when the royals get married or have a kid, like all the news covers, there's none of that. He comes into the world through complete humility, just as God would have him to. Flip over to chapter 2 with me, Luke 2. Let's read about the birth of our Savior. Verse 1 starts this way, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Why did Luke put that? 
just as a frame of reference for history. And wouldn't you know it, when you go back through the history books, there was a governor in Syria named Corinthians. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Now, this fulfills a prophecy given in Micah chapter 5. In Micah chapter 5, it says this, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Again, God is fulfilling His promise. He's fulfilling the prophecy. And so how does God do this? God does this by causing the emperor to decree a census. Okay? Proverbs 21 verse 1 tells us that God can do that. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, writes uh, King Solomon. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. The reason that this decree went out was because that's the way God wanted it done. Look at verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, which is what we learned from Micah 5. Again, God fulfilling that promise. Because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a what? Because there was no room for them in the inn. And just like that, God is in the world. He's in the world in flesh. He's just like you and I. He has blood running through his body. He has skin, hair, eyes, a nose. All of the things that we have in our existence as human beings, suddenly God has. And he's here. Mary and Joseph go down to Bethlehem because it was God's will for Jesus to be born there. They used earthly people and earthly circumstances to bring about His desired result. That simply teaches us that He is sovereign over everything. I'd also like to point out that when it mentions in, some folks get a little confused. They don't quite understand what that means. It was a home. And in this particular home, there was a guest room. And most likely that guest room was upstairs. And it was already there. It wasn't as if the innkeeper was being mean or nasty. The person that owned the home that they went to simply told them, we don't have room, I'm sorry, it's already occupied. So that meant that Mary and Joseph could and must stay down in the living quarters. Now the thing about the living quarters is that at night, sometimes they bring the animals in. And they bring the animals in so that they wouldn't be in danger, right? So that nothing would happen to them. So that they can eat and rest and, and privacy and security while the, the owner slept. And can we spend just a minute talking about the manger? Again, Jesus' birth was remarkably simple, but God's plan is really specific and deliberate. Manger comes from the Latin word to chew or eat. Isn't that interesting? It refers to a trough. And at this particular trough, the horses and the donkeys and those animals would come and they'd put food out. And you all know what a trough is. It was a dirty, old, dusty feeding trough. Sir sure, Joseph and Mary would clean it up. I'm sure that they did the best they could. They padded it, maybe, so that the little baby would have a comfy bed. But there's no way to romanticize this bed into anything other than what it was. It was a feeding trough were slaughtering nasty animals. And this was all they had. That's important because in His humility, Christ comes into the world. He's not placed in a royal cradle. He's placed in a feeding trough, a manger. It was common uh, to be used where the scraps were thrown. All sorts of nastiness. We wouldn't have eaten out of it, that's for sure. It was simple but deliberate. Watch this, because 30-something years later, 
Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 26 at the Last Supper, take, eat, this is my what? Body. Isn't that something? That from the very beginning, God places the Lamb, the sacrifice for all mankind, the very first night He is in this world, He's placed in a manger, a feeding trough, fulfilling what he would say 30-something years later when he instituted what we know as the Last Supper. God was preparing Jesus for the end of his life at the very beginning of his life. And he was only doing so for your sins and for mine. We'll get into the shepherds next week. I love Christmas too much to just spend one week on it. We'll spend a couple of weeks on Christmas. But I want you to notice something else about them and the manger. In verse 11, the angel of the Lord tells the shepherds that Jesus has been born. And that to believe this and bear witness, they would need a sign. And the angel gave it because in verse 12, it says, And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a feeding trough, lying in a manger. Not swaddling clothes is a big deal. Every baby in Bethlehem was wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's not the sign. The sign is the manger. Because every baby in Bethlehem was not sleeping in a manger that night. That was the sign. And in several years, when the wise men would come and see, I'm sure that feeding trough may still have been there. Some type of symbol, perhaps. Must have sounded so wild, though, that the shepherds probably did not think that they heard the angel correctly. He's lying in a feeding trough. The Savior is? Christ is? The Lord? They put him in a manger? That's what the angel said, though. That's the sign. Isn't it interesting to think, remember, and consider that no other king in the world was lying in a feeding trough. But the angel says, you found the baby lying there in that manger and you found the king of kings and the lord of lords. Years ago, another interesting sign was seen hanging in a store window during the Christmas season. The original message stated, let's make this the best Christmas ever. Have you ever heard that? Let's make this the best Christmas ever. But underneath, some wise person has scribbled how can we top the first one? Boy, isn't that true? The answer is we can. According to an old legend, Satan and his demons were having a Christmas party. As the demonic guests were departing, one grinned and said to Satan, Merry Christmas, Your Majesty. At that, Satan replied with a growl, Yes, keep it merry. If they ever get serious about it, we'll all be in trouble. Man, get serious about it. Get serious about remembering and realizing, not just between Thanksgiving and New Year, but all year long. Get serious and remember and realize how important the birth of Christ was. How remarkably simple it was for sure. And that God brought him into the world so humbly but that God's plan was really very specific and that He was fulfilling this rock solid promise. And why? For your sins and for mine. That's simply why He did it. We, um, we had an interesting experience while we were away. We went to the heart. I told you all that. Man, it's big. They won't know up and they will show nothing. We had been there and we go early in the morning because you, know, you got to go see all the animals. Harper hears there's a donkey. All bits are So we go real early because it's nice and cool and the animals will be out. You know, all of that. It was, it was, it was good. But as we are leaving the, the, the animal area, we're walking back toward the ark. There's a little bit of a walk. Friend, I am here to tell you that when we look back toward the west, it was black like Armageddon kind of rain. You know what I mean? You know like when the clouds get real black and you start hugging loved ones? Because this is it. <laughs> this, is, this is it. It was, it was like that. 
Now, most of the people were running toward the ark. It was unbelievable. Not us. <clears throat> suddenly realized that Noah was right. That Noah was going to die. That they were going to die. Noah was right in his prophecy. Say all that to say this. Right now the ark is still open. People can still get on. People can still accept Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. We still can repent of our sin and sell ourselves out to Him and do our very best as sinful, wicked human beings to live for Him. But the day's coming when that door slams shut. And it won't matter how much we pray or how much we beat on the side of that thing. We ain't getting in. My message to you this morning is this. God's promises are rock solid. His plan was really specific. Jesus' birth was remarkably simple. All of that happened for your sin and for mine. And if you don't take advantage of what God has given you in the way of a Savior, in my opinion, you deserve all that hell has in medicine. Because you've heard the plan of salvation. You've seen what God did for you and your sinfulness. And now the choice is yours. The decision is yours to make. Will you accept the gift of eternal life that was given through this little baby boy lying in a feeding trough. All God's people said. Amen. Stand to your feet this morning if you would. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We won't have an invitation on the piano, but I, I do just want to give you an opportunity to respond. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted this free gift of eternal life, if you're not sure, you, you just don't know, I would invite you to come forward this morning.